Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Good morning. Welcome to the 28th lecture on economics, management and entrepreneurship. During the last 27 lectures, we had very elaborately discussed the principles of economics as applied to business in particular. In that, we first of all discussed about microeconomics, concepts of demand, supply, price elasticity of demand, so on and so forth. Then we came down to the company level and discussed about various topics, break even analysis, costing, both product costing and process costing budgeting, accounting and finally, the time value of money and how to compare among different economic alternatives. They are required because to carry out or to start an enterprise and to sustain the enterprise for a long time, it is required that the company is financially viable and therefore, the financial angle must be thoroughly understood. The financial background the entrepreneur must definitely have. At the same time, to achieve the objectives of the company which is that of sustainability and growth the proper aspects of management must be very clear to the entrepreneur. So, from today onwards, we shall discuss about different aspects of management that are crucial to start and run a business. Let us understand that just as engineering as a foundation on physics. Similarly, management has its foundation on or is founded on the principles of economics and psychology. Today, we shall give a short introduction to how the management thoughts evolved during the last 150 years or so and then we shall elaborate in the future lectures on different generic functions of management before we actually venture into different functional management aspects such as marketing, production, finance and so on and so forth. So, today we shall devote our full lectures on realizing how the management concepts grew in the first place and how it became a discipline in its own right. This historical perspective is very important because once the initial phase of development of management theory is understood, then they can be put in today's context and then one can realize how important the management principles are in 
sustainability in the achievement of the objectives of sustainability and growth. So, we start today our lecture on evolution of management thoughts. That means, we shall talk about the beginning of scientific management or beginning of management as recognized as a science. Evolution of management thoughts. First of all, let us understand that there are different meanings of management and the word management itself may mean different things in different contexts. One, it could be the act of management, meaning the task of managing. It could also mean the body of knowledge pertaining to the tasks of managers. It could also mean the managers themselves. So, when we talk about top management, we are basically referring to the higher echelon of management in a company. In our discussion, we shall mostly use the second meaning of the word management. The second meaning is the word management to mean the body of knowledge pertaining to the tasks of manager. This means that we shall be concerned ourselves with mostly the principles of management, the body of knowledge that consists of the principles. Once the principles are understood, we shall also focus on how these principles are applied in practice. Now, we come to popular definitions of management. The word management is defined in many ways depending on the authors. Various authors have defined the word management in various ways. There is not a single definition. So, what we intend to do here is to reproduce certain definitions given by very celebrated authorities in the field of management and then we shall try to find out the common themes underlying these definitions and then we shall focus on those themes that would give us the right way of understanding the meaning of or, or the defining the word management. The most popular way in which management is defined is getting things done. Normally, when we say I managed to get this work done, I, it means that I got this work done. So, when I say that it is getting things done, it means that it is not me who did the work, but I coordinated the work with the help of a group of people in such a way that the objective of the work or the work itself was achieved. So, it is organizing and coordinating among a group of people, so that the work was done. So, a very short colloquial and very effective way of defining the word management is getting things done. This of course, appears very superficial because there are many implicit meaning. How does one get things done? How does one plan, organize, coordinate and control so that the work is done? these aspects are not reflected, are not 
made very explicit in this definition. But the basic intent of this definition is that the work gets done by a person with the help of others and it is it has to be implicitly understood that the way the things got done have to be properly understood and properly implemented. Now, let us look at certain other definitions. Management is the process of working with and through individuals and groups to accomplish organizational goals. Now, in this definition, the first definition is little extended by saying that to get things done, it has to be done with the help of and with the use of or with the uh, association, cooperation of a group of people. And this is highlighted in this second definition that says it is the process of working with and through individuals and groups to accomplish organizational goal. So, when it says working with, it means that the person who is charged with the responsibility of getting things done, he is also he or she is also a part of the individuals or groups who are entrusted with the work of with the objective of doing the work. That means, he is not separate from the group. So, this the second definition therefore, says second definition therefore, is an extension of the first definition in the sense in two sense. One it says that a group is thoroughly associated in doing the work and that the management itself is a part of the group these two things are included in the second definition. The third definition says management is the task of planning, organizing, directing and controlling the efforts, uh, efforts of others towards meeting a specific objective. Now, in this third definition what is highlighted is the task of management that of planning, organizing, directing and controlling. So, these are different functions or tasks specific tasks of management with the help of which the work gets done. So, in this definition the tasks of management or functions of management are highlighted. The fourth definition is a little elaborate. It says management is concerned with efficient utilization of human, physical and financial resources for socio-economic well-being of man to the specific objectives of remunerative wages and good service conditions to employees adequate return on investment and quality product or service to the customer at the minimum price. Now, this definition is quite elaborate, but it focuses on three four things. One it says that management must be concerned with efficient utilization of all the resources that it has got with it. The resources are human resources, the people who are associated in doing the work, the employees of the organization, the financial resources, the cash, the investment made by the owners and the physical resources like material, machines, buildings, they must not remain idle, they must be efficiently utilized to do the work. So, this aspect is highlighted here, but at the same time what is also highlighted in this definition is that it says who are the main stakeholders of a company. 
there are three types of stakeholders that it talks about. One, the employees, they must be properly paid, remuneration and wage, they must be properly paid. The organization must make enough profit, it must have enough income so that it can pay its employees well. Number two is the customers for whom the products and services are made. Customers must be given their products in the best quality possible and at the least price or most reasonable price so that they buy your product. The customers must therefore be satisfied. The investors who have invested their money in the business, enough return on investment must be available at the end of the year so that the profit the investor gets some profit or certain dividends. This is the inven investor's interest and finally, one the organization should not indulge in making products and services that are bad for the society at large. It should not create pollution for example, which will affect the human population or the animal population. Now, it should not pollute the environment, the society and the environment must not be affected by the work of the organization. So, this definition is very elaborate, but it highlights many many important aspects. It talks about efficient utilization of resources, it talks about satisfying the stakeholders of the company and it also talks about the uh, efficient utilization of the resources. We take two more definitions, one it analyzes alternatives, decides which alternative is the best and acts or motivates others to act to accomplish some end. Now, this definition talks about how a decision is taken to act or motivate others to act to achieve the desired end. It says that it has to first of all have certain alternatives, evaluate those alternatives and then decides which alternative is the best way of achieving the goal and then acts to achieve that objective or the goal. So, this talks about a little, a little detailed aspects of how actions are resulted from planning, comparing among or evaluating the alternatives and deciding and acting. The final definition is management is the process of designing and maintaining an environment in which individuals working together in groups efficiently accomplish selected aims. So, this definition is more about designing a proper atmosphere, a proper work environment which motivates the employees of the organization to work in cohesion, to work in a group to achieve the desired objectives. So, the, these five or six I think five definitions highlight many aspects of management that we shall elaborate in course of our lecture, but understanding in depth their meaning is very important and therefore, I spent nearly 20 minutes time on these definitions. Now, that we have got these definitions and certain ideas regarding what management is about, let us now take up some more topic or rather before we do that, 
let us find out the common themes in these definitions. One management is concerned with a group. Whenever we talk of management, it is not a single person's game, it has to be a group activity and that is where management is mostly applicable. The second aspect is that management is universal. When I say management is universal, it means that it has implications in all types of systems, whether they are products, product manufacturing systems or service delivery systems, whether it is a hospital or an educational institute or whether it is an auto manufacturing company or a television manufacturing company. Now, it is universal, it is ubiquitous when we are making a plan to make a tour of let us say Andamans, we also have to manage this. If we are conducting a festival in a in an institution, spring festival or techno festival, then also we need to manage the event. So, whenever there is a group activity, management principles are very relevant. They are universal, they are ubiquitous. Management is goal oriented. Everywhere throughout our lectures, we shall focus on deciding on certain goals or objectives, certain ends. If you do not have specific aims or objectives or goals, we shall we shall define each one of them separately, the meaning of the word goal, the meaning of the word objective etcetera, but for the time being let us assume that they are synonymous. Unless we have an end, we shall do anything we like without knowing what exactly we want to be or what we want to achieve. Therefore, goals must be fixed. So, these definitions all along say to achieve an end, to achieve an objective or a goal, to accomplish a task to achieve a goal. So, these definitions also highlight the goal orientation of management. It is also concerned with enhancing productivity and similar such measures. Productivity means produce more by efficient utilization of your input resources. Use less input, produce more output that is productivity and we shall discuss a little more later on the various meanings of the word productivity, but basically it talks about efficient utilization of the resources that we have with, uh, we, with us or with uh, that the organization has with it. So, these are different connotations from uh, that we had derived from the definitions that we have outlined earlier for the word management. Now, that we have done this, let us go further and talk about a very interesting topic of whether management is an art or a science. In this context, we would like to give some idea regarding art for example. We know that music is an art, painting is an art, architecture and medicine they used to be art, particularly medicine and architecture they continued to be art for a very, very long time, but today medicine is no longer an art. Architecture has also is quite added by the scientific approaches that have been forwarded by many pioneers in the field. So, although 
medicine and architecture remained art for thousands of years. Today they are no longer art. Similar is the story with management. Management have gone through a complete metamorphosis in the last 150 years. At one time it was an art, it depended on the judgment of the person who was managing the work, who was getting things done. But today this decision or the judgment is backed up by different ideas that are generated from scientific approach to the problem. And we will see that many problems, managerial problems can be solved by scientific approach. However, a number of management problems still elude scientific solutions and depend still on the art management as an art. This is what we are trying to say in this slide. Medicine and engineering had remained more like an art in the past, but today with the use of scientific method that has helped in organizing knowledge about these subjects, medicine and engineering have been transformed into subjects of science. Management had remained an art, but it is in transition from an art based on experience and judgment to a profession based on underlying organized knowledge and structure of principles of science just as medicine and engineering. Now let us dwell on certain events that happened 100 years ago or more on how management as a science developed. And the credit of management growing as a scientific profession is given to Frederick Taylor. So, it is important to know how Frederick Taylor developed these ideas, what these what his ideas are and how relevant those ideas are in today's context. Well, although we shall talk about Taylor who is also called the father of scientific management, there are others like Fayol and Mayo who are also credited with giving new ideas to principles of management. Fayol is called the father of modern management and Mayo the father of humanistic school of thought and there are a large number of other contributors to the arena of management thoughts. We will of course not be able to discuss many things, but definitely I would like to talk about these three towering personalities who have contributed maximum to the thought process of management particularly in its initial phase of development. First. Frederick Winslow Taylor, born in 1856 and continued up to 1915. Now, there is a mistake here, this should be 1889. Frederick W. Taylor, famous for giving the foundation of management as a science. The work that he did, he did lot of work, 
but the work that received the attention of the then fraternity engineering fraternity is the study on swaveling that he carried out in Bethlehem Steel Company USA in the year 1889. Bethlehem Steel Company he studied a problem where 400 to 600 people were handling a variety of materials like coal, ore and ash. Now, density wise you will see that iron ore will be the highest followed by coal followed by ash. And Taylor was interested, he was a young engineer, he was interested to find out the best swivel size for the materials carried. Okay. What should be the size of the swivel for different types of materials that are being that were being carried. Remember or notice that the materials coal, ore and ash had different densities. Now, he observed that each man was choosing his own shovel to handle the materials and there was a specific shovel that was assigned to him and the person was using his own shovel to handle the materials and that was nothing very surprising about it. Normally, I use my own tool. So, similarly, a worker was given a shovel and he was using that shovel. So, apparently it was not very surprising, but Taylor thought otherwise. He thought that it is possible to design the shovel size so that the person's productivity in terms of tons swelled, tons of material swelled in a particular time period is maximized. So, first he observed and he found that while swelling coal, the load carried in the swell was about 3.5 pounds while it was 3.8 pounds for ore. So, it was a little more compared to ore uh, compared to coal. So, he made a hypothesis based on this observation that different shovel sizes could be used for materials of different densities to maximize worker productivity. He says if it is S, a different shovel size should be used, if it is ore another shovel size should be used and if it is coal still some other size of the shovel should be used. There should be different sizes depending on the material that is shoveled. This was, this was his hypothesis and he was not sure whether this hypothesis would be true. So, what he did was that he carried out certain experiments or tests and analyzed those results. Testing of hypothesis and analysis of the test results. So, he, what he did he selected two good experienced swellers. and then he gave them large shovels that carried large load. He successively reduced the shovel size by cutting off their tips, then he noted the amount shoveled per day and used that as a measure of the worker productivity that is the analysis of the result. 
So, he made them use different swivel sizes and then he noted down the amount swivel per day and that was the measure of the productivity of the worker. The maximum material was swivel per day when the load on the swivel was 21.5 pounds. The maximum material went up to 21.5 pounds per day compared to only 3.5 or 3.8 pounds. This meant that small swivels were needed, this was his conclusion, that small swivels were needed to carry high density load such as ore and large swivels were needed to carry light load. So, that the load carried at any time on a swivel was constant. So, if the density is high, the swivel size is small therefore, the volume carried was small. So, the density into volume is same as when it was carrying as low density and large volume. So, that the load carried was constant. So, what was happening earlier was that when a particular person was using the sim a particular swivel for ore, he was carrying more material because the size of the swivel was high large. So, the weight of the swivel or weight of the material carried was large. So, his productivity had come down. Now, according to his principles, if the if ore was to be swiveled, then a smaller size swivel was good or better, and when S is to be transported or swiveled, then a bigger size swivel would be more suitable. Thus, Taylor accepted his original hypothesis that different swivel sizes should be used for materials of different densities. This was his conclusion. So, he made first of all certain observations regarding the way things were happening in Bethlehem company. Second, he made a hypothesis. Third, he tested under certain conditions so as to either accept or reject his hypothesis. He analyzed the results and finally concluded that his original hypothesis is ok, is cannot be rejected, it has to be accepted. Now, Taylor put his findings into practice in the following ways. A tool room was established and special sovels were purchased. The foreman notified the tool room in advance the work his gangmen would do that particular day. That means, whether they would carry ass or whether they would carry ore. Large size sovels were provided for soveling asses, middle size sovels for coal and small size sovels for soveling ore. When implemented, the productivity increased from 16 to 59 from 16 tons per day to 59 tons per day, about nearly 3.5 or 4 times productivity improved. Now, look at the implementation. What he did was that certain procurement was made, different sizes of swivel were procured and they were kept in the tool room. Then the foreman, the foreman informed the tool room in advance that that particular day ass will be swivelled or coal will be swivelled or ore will be swivelled. Accordingly, the 
So, wells of that size were issued to the persons. Now, contrast this with the previous practice where the workers used to select his own shovel and was using it. Now, this is a change in the practice of management, the way it was being managed. The workers were choosing their own tools. They were now said that no, tools will be issued, issued to you depending on the type of work you are going to do. So, this is a change in the philosophy, the management philosophy that Taylor propounded way back in 1859, nearly a century and a half ago. The methods that Taylor followed was similar or was akin to the elements of scientific method. Scientific method is a celebrated method that is used in science to prove or disprove hypothesis. The same method known as scientific method is also used in social science to test hypothesis and to either reject it or accept it. And scientific method had these four elements of making observation, making a hypothesis which is usually called a null hypothesis and then test the hypothesis, reject the hypothesis or do not reject the hypothesis. And Taylor had exactly followed this sequence to arrive at his conclusions and this got wide, wide attention in the management and engineering fraternity of those days in USA. And Taylor coined the term scientific management to this approach to emphasize the scientific approach management should take to accomplish its task. So, this he coined the term scientific management to emphasize that management at least in the soft floor is not an art. It can be supported by the same scientific method that is used in science and social science to understand the nature of relationships and to improve and design the systems. The similar approaches can be utilized also in management. So, he termed he coined the term scientific management. And in fact, he had written two books, one in 1906 calling it SOP management, the other in 1911 calling it principles of scientific management. Now, his other contributions are the following. He used the elements of scientific method rather than thumb rules for each element of a man's work. Management should plan the method of doing a work rather than leave it to the worker to choose his or her own methods and select his or her own tools and equipment. This is what I was trying to tell you. The work on shoveling clearly showed that the management had made a plan as to how to carry out the work and not allow the worker to choose his methods of doing the work. Management must select the best worker for each particular task and then train, teach and develop him. instead of allowing him to select his own task and train himself as best as possible. 
and there should be equitable division of work and responsibility between management and worker. That means, a worker should know what his responsibilities are and management should also be aware of his own responsibilities are. The management is supposed to plan the methods of work, the tools and the techniques that the worker should follow. He should select the best worker, he should give the best possible training to do the work in the way that the management decides and then the worker will do the work. So, this division of labor of planning and execution between management and worker was Taylor's original idea. Now, other notable contributions Taylor had uh, as the is the unique contribution of inventing high speed steel that almost tripled production in particularly in the machining process. Taylor's tool life equation is extensively used even today by production engineers to estimate the life of a tool. Taylor also introduced the stopwatch time study to find out the time of doing an operation. He introduced also the wage incentive systems. He said a person who is more productive, a worker who is more productive should be paid higher wage and piece rate system the more you produce the more wage you earn was his idea. He suggested also a functional organization of flow of authority in which managers with specialized knowledge will guide the workers to do their work efficiently. We will talk about functional organization in some detail later. So, you can see that Taylor in his lifetime not only contributed to the original term scientific management, but he also proved it by many of his contributions. The wage incentive system, the tool life equation and talking about functional organization are all his ideas. Therefore, that Taylor is called the father of scientific management is fully justified. Now, we shall quickly go through some other works by his contemporaries. Fayol was a contemporary of Taylor, he is from France, a mining engineer and became the managing director of that company. His contribution is given in the book which he authored in 1916 on administration industriale et generale, which in English means general and industrial management. Here Fayol is more concerned not with soft floor management, but with top management like administration. So, he is more concerned with theory of administration and he is called the father of modern management and he says that there are different activities that are basic to all individual organizations. There are technical activities, commercial activities, financial, security, accounting, managerial. He was the first person who suggested that management has got various functions. We will in fact devote a full lecture on these functions of management and he talked, told about planning as a first function, organizing, command, coordination and control. As I said, we shall discuss on these functions of management elaborately in our forthcoming, in our next lecture in fact. Then we talk about Mayo, 
the father of humanistic school of thought. He was also a contemporary of Frederick Taylor. He was from Harvard University. He is a sociologist and he introduced the humanistic school of thought into the theory of management. Like the story of Sobeling, there is a story about the Western Electric Company at Hawthorne known as Hawthorne study. There the managers were studying the effect of illumination on worker productivity. That means, if the work area is properly illuminated, they were they were having a hypothesis that if the work area is properly illuminated, then the worker productivity will rise. They were already conducting such a study and they were having a hypothesis that better lighting condition has a favorable effect on worker productivity. So, what they did? They selected two groups of workers. One group called a control group worked in a room with similar lighting conditions as the workshop. And a second group called a test group worked in another room with lighting conditions that were controlled at desired values. That means, the test group was they were working in a place where the illumination was sometimes very good and sometimes very bad. So, that was the test group they found that the worker productivity increased for the test group when illumination was better. What was not expected however, was that the worker productivity also increased in the control group. Although there was no better illumination, it also increased in the control group. So, they could not explain why when the illumination was not better in the control group, their productivity is rising. So, no definite conclusions could be drawn. They therefore, invited the sociologist Mayo and his associates of the Harvard Graduate School of Business Administration to conduct a study. They conducted the study in the telephone relay section of the company. They selected a group of women workers and introduced the following working conditions for them. They gave them scheduled rest periods, company lunches and shorter work weeks and they found that their output has rose dramatically. So, when these privileges were given to these women workers, their output improved dramatically and later they withdrew these privileges. They found that instead of their output coming down, it rose to a even new time high this result was baffling. So, they then said the only explanation that they could give was that human factors were at work. It means what? It meant that women felt that they were an important part of the company. They apparently looked upon themselves as participating members of a congenial cohesive group as a special or a select organization. The relationships elicited feeling of affiliation, competence and achievement. Work to the group members became more meaningful and interesting leading to increased output. Mayo concluded that human factors were more important than technical and physical factors and this was the beginning of the humanistic school of thought which demanded greater recognition of the human element in any organized activity. So, friends there are many contributions we have selected just three contributions to give a historical perspective. Taylor coined the term scientific management and said that work methods must be planned for by the management, the best workers should be followed and trained so that the productivity rises. His ideas were applicable mostly at the soft floor. 
Elton Mayo of the Harvard Business School. He and his associates on the basis of their study, they said that the employees, they contribute quite a lot. They have to understand that they are part of the organization. They must be committed to do the work, to do the work. If that commitment comes, if they feel that they are one in the organization, they are important in the organization, the feeling of importance, the feeling of belongingness, if they have, then they will rise to the occasion, meet the challenges and do work. So, the technical aspects is important, but the human aspects are even more important. This was the new school of thought, the humanistic school of thought. And then of course, we talked about Fayol of France, who said that management is universal and there are generic functions of planning, organizing, commanding, coordinating and controlling. These are different functions of management that are very generic in nature. These aspects I have discussed here because I think that they will give you an insight as to how management are principles have, are, have developed over the years. Thank you very much.